Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Camel, and more importantly, welcome back to the Elder Scrolls Detective series. A series in which we investigate, curate, speculate, hypothesize, theorize, and quite often simply highlight and discuss cool, interesting, and hidden things that can be found within the Elder Scrolls games. Today, we will find ourselves abound in a web of disturbing discoveries. Unnatural or natural, we'll have to untangle the truth from the icy and ash-smeared grips of Solstone. Now, links to my other Elder Scrolls Detective videos can be found down in the description along with links for my social media. Be sure to check them all out after this investigation. To Solstone the last frozen bastion before the Sea of Ghosts and the long-lost continent of Admora. This frost-bitten kingdom holds many grim yet gorgeous secrets and mysteries, many of which echo through legend, but also have grounding foundation in the island's past and present. In the north, we have plains of permafrost and mountainous ice shelves, whitewashed with cold winds and dotted with ancient interests. In these snowy regions of Solstone, there are native albino spiders, found rarely within some caves and even more rarely found outside. Over thousands of years, they have adapted to survive in the fields of porcelain, becoming white to blend in and go, for the most part, unnoticed in their wintry homeland. To the south, however, the land of Solstheim has been bastardized, disfigured in blast waves of pyroclastic gas, thanks to the eruption of Red Mountain on Vardenfell. And we know who's responsible for that. And if you don't, you can learn about it in this video I've already done about the most dangerous tree in Skyrim. But the once pristine pastures of wild white forests are now rendered grey, scarred and scorched. Trees bent and stripped, bosks burnt and sundered in the ashen shadow of the mockingly fiery sunrise that so beautifully silhouettes the transgressor, Red Mountain. The land is peppered with globular blotches of its magma. This new, unwelcome searing of Solstheim has twisted and tortured the wildlife. We can find ash spawn, likely birthed from the fiery phlegm of Red Mountain, which it spat across the land as a reminder of its seething infection. The elegant woodland mothers, creatures of nature, and the forest, the Spriggans, have been set aflame and are trapped within a smouldering prison, their very own bodies. Mother Nature molested by the molten fury of the Red Tower, once the Bastille of Lorcan's heart and Dagathur's citadel. Red Mountain won't be forgotten anytime soon. Like the Spriggans, another familiar creature has been melted and mutated along with the smelted ecosystem. We can find small spiders, but they are not albino spiders. They are flame spiders. Once white and shy, now red, fiery and ready to burn unsuspecting prey. More and more of them can be found along the southern coast of Selstone next to heartstone deposits, ruby deposits and flaming clumps of Red Mountain's heart. Have these spiders truly been forged from the shattered bones of Sakrostrunma, as Red Mountain is called in Dovazul, the Dragon Tongue? Does it have the power to infuse with creatures and turn them into acolytes of fire and willless elemental thralls? It would appear so, and it would explain why we only find fire spiders in the burnt lands to the south. But the power and corruption of Red Mountain doesn't explain why we can find these. Other spiders, not albino, nor flame spiders, but frost spiders. If not from Red Mountain, where are these variations of spiders coming from? Well, to find the truth of it, we'll have to delve into the archaic Nordic ruin of White Ridge Barrow. Perched at the birthing place of this icy spring fueled by snow runoff, White Ridge Barrow looks peaceful and picturesque. Be sure to savor it, as what it holds within is far from it. As soon as we enter, we will stumble upon a scene of slaughter, two dead reavers. There are also two bedrolls, suggesting that they camped out here for some time, before discovering or uncovering something that they wish they hadn't, as is evident by the fact that they are dead. The door leading further in is barred with a wooden beam, but it looks like not even that was enough. 
As we shift the shaft and open the doors, a corpse will slump down onto the ground in front of us. Seems even with his friends inside, the Reaver was willing to bar the door just to keep whatever was in there out. So, naturally, we're going to delve deeper. As we make our way down, we'll start to find the corpses of albino spiders, with signs of their nesting, webbing, egg sacs, standard spider interior design. Soon we'll be met by this round hallway, at the crest of which is an entryway with traces of plunder and a descending staircase in which we will take down into the depths, at the base of which is a short hallway which leads into a rather busy chamber with more spiders, pulsating web sacks and treasure. But an immensely disturbing discovery awaits us on the lower floor. A bandit, she was looking rather yellow and is wearing a large necklace. Haha, <laughs> classic Soulstone fashion. I jest, as this is no adornment, he has a gyrating spider latched onto his neck, sucking, slurping and steering. As we can see, this flame spider is on friendly terms with the bandit as they pass one another like co-workers on the same shift. Okay, firstly, it's strange we can find a flame spider down here despite being nowhere near the other flame spiders on Solstheim, specifically down on the southern shores, with the scarring and scorching of Red Mountain. And secondly, there is a spider that appears to be controlling a bandit. That's pretty weird. It's wrapped around his neck and injecting its will into the spinal column and brain stem of this poor chap. And while this is by no means a normal sight, in short time it will be. Before we press deeper into White Ridge Barrow, there is a staircase at the back of the chamber leading up to a door locked in thick webs. Burning them away and kicking down the doors reveals a tomb. The spiders have been breeding in here too. Laying around, we can find a few skeletons and drug corpses on the floor. I pray to the Nine Divines that these spiders haven't been mind-controlling the dead. That's just a can of worms I don't want to have to deal with. Maybe this guy was an arachnophobic and simply died of shock when he walked in here. Or maybe his corpse has been desiccated by the slow acid venom of the spiders, a nice juicy human milkshake for later on. Regardless of the truth of it, it's not painting a pretty picture for our sojourn ahead. But if you wanted pretty pictures, you should have just gone to my Instagram. So on we push. Further into the barrow, more flame spiders, albino spiders, signs of ancient Nordic culture, pulsating spider sacks ready to burst with eight legged foes. And scarily, more of these terrifying, soul enslaving, mind control spiders. These are actually wholesomely horrific. And given some of the things in Skyrim, that's really saying something. After progressing through the next narrow vestibule, and after tripping over more of these annoying creepy crawlies, we'll find a room with a number of gem deposits and heartstone deposits. A strangely common sight in this dungeon. Anyway, breaking through the next stone wall and back into the barrow, we'll be met by the door that leads into White Ridge Sanctum. We will, of course, be entering it. Now the first thing we run across is another barred door, but strangely, there are two Draga down here. So it seems that they barred the door because they're on the side that was barred. I'm not too sure what this scene is meant to tell us, but it does appear that even the Draga feared what was inside and blocked its path by wedging this wooden beam across the door. Well, alright, in we go, straight into a big open chamber with many sights to see. It would appear to be vaguely guarded by these mind-controlled bandits with their masters latched onto their necks, sinking their grey fangs deep into the flesh of their meaty vehicles. Now the room is split down the middle by a shattering chasm. If one were to be unlucky enough to fall down, you'd be met by water and have the company of many skeletons and gem deposits. Luckily, if you survive, there is a tunnel leading out. Along the way, there is a round room with a treasure chest, and if we look up, our gaze will be met by a grate, which leads straight down from the floor of the very chamber we fell down from in the first place. But to get back up, because levitation's been cut out of the game, we'll have to use this series of stairs and tunnels until out we pop back into the main hall. Now at the back of this stone gallery, there is an oddly out of place looking woman. 
She isn't yellow, nor does she have a mind control spider on her neck. But the spiders also aren't attacking her, suggesting she is on good, or at the very least, neutral terms with them. Whew, she is one grim looking girl. Her name is Merila Rendis. And I bet if you were trapped in a tomb with spiders all day, you would look pretty grim too. When we approach her, she will be hostile. And despite having a glass dagger drawn, she'll put that away and pull out something very unexpected. Merila will whip out nothing other than spiders and hurl them towards us. Exploding flame spiders, jumping flame spiders, flame cloaked spiders. Forget using a shield, bring bug spray. And I mean, we all have weapons of choice, but hers, well, hers are more of web pawns of choice. Funnily enough, it would appear that her eight-legged grenades would be the end of her as she blasts herself to death with her very own spiders. Merila Rendis is dead. We should search her body and look for answers. First of all, we can find her weaponized spiders, which we'll talk about later on. But for now, let's see if her journal can shed any light on this mess. I know what he's planning. Does he really think he can take all of the credit for discovering these spiders? Next time he goes into the safety cage to do whatever it is he does with those spiders, I'll lock the door. He'll have no choice but to listen to me then. What does he mean about me not being right in the head? There's nothing wrong with me. He's the one trying to steal my discovery. Does he think I don't see what he's doing? There's nothing wrong with me, nothing! He keeps talking to me like I'm insane. I'm not insane, who said I'm insane? Did I say he was insane? I'll show him insane. It doesn't matter. He'll see what real power is. The chanting we heard just outside the main chamber must mean there's something extremely powerful there. If I can get my hands on that energy and bring it back, who knows what kind of discoveries we can make from it. Okay, so it's quite evident that Merila is a little bit in the head. A few screws loose, maybe it's cause she spent too much time on the web. But there are some interesting things revealed here. Discovering spiders, safety cage, he, chanting power. Let's have a poke around and see if we can find any of these things that she's talking about. Well, at the very back of the room where she stood, we can find a huge clump of webs. But if one looks closely enough, we'll discover that there is actually a passageway being blocked off by these very webs. Naturally, we'll get rid of these damned webs and see what's in there. As we approach the next ritualistic looking door, we'll hear it. Chanting, is this what she could hear? The chanting? Or maybe she could hear this. The great and haunting howls of something deep and powerful. This is likely the power that sent Merila insane. A common thread in the Elder Scrolls, people being sent insane by underground power. Let's find out what's back here. A small chamber with a word wall. That explains the chanting and likely what Merila was seeking, the great hidden power locked within the word wall. But be cautious, as we approach, we'll unwillingly discover that this is the resting place of a great and ancient dragon priest named Dukan. Translated from Dovazul, his name means devour kine or dishonor. He was one of the priests to serve with Merak and will use frost and conjuration magic to destroy us. Now he also bears an eponymous dragon priest mask, Dukan, which you can learn more about here in the guide I've already done for it. Now if we turn around, under the stairs we came down we'll discover a source of even greater power. The Black Book, the Sallow Regent. Woe betide my fate-wrecked heart, which gives no tender shine to he, who gave his favour up to gods and brought his blood-struck mind to me. This tome of inter and outer realm knowledge is a gift, a curse, left by the Daedric Prince of Knowledge Hermaeus Mora. This black, mist-infused ingot of paper and power is the source of the godly howls and echoes we heard earlier.
the wailing cries of ambience vibrating through the realms as Hermaeus Mora groans in timeless lexiconic omniscience. Along with the word wall, this source of great power, the Black Book of the Cellar Regent, could very well be the well in which Merilar's corruption began, although I think she had a few screws loose to begin with. So that explains the chanting, and that explains the great power that Merilar was looking for. But who was the he she referenced, and where is this cage? Well, there is one last passage we have not yet explored that stems off of the main chamber, making use of these wooden ramps that lead through a hole in the wall. This exits out into a smaller room filled with spiders and their webs, some ruby deposits, and a few dead bandits. In here is also the cage that Merilar wrote of in her journal, but before we break into it, let's inspect the surrounding area. Underneath the wooden structure supporting the cage, there is a short hallway which leads out into a bedroom. The spiders have done an excellent job redecorating. I'm a big fan of the chair stuck to the wall. It's a good look. There are also a number of books on varying topics. There are potions, soul gems, and an assortment of valuable precious stones of all kinds. It would appear that Merila, or whoever else lives here, are quite scholarly and educated mages. There are also two beds, suggesting that Merila and this he slept in separate beds, so they were unlikely in a relationship. On one of the bedside tables, there is another key to the cage upstairs. We'll be sure to grab it for use later on. Now up on the wooden platform that supports the cage, there is a pathway leading deeper into the stone. Where the wood meets the dirt, there is a wooden ladder leading out to Skyrim. We'll be sure to use it when it's time to leave, provided we get to leave this death-woven tomb. Now if we follow the path, it will lead into what appears to be a mineshaft, with evidence of it once being used to mine ruby and metal ore. The bulk of the mine has since collapsed, so we'll have to head back. Before we enter the testing cage, there is one last thing that has caught my eye. Another locked cage door leading directly into a sea of webs. If we pick and burn our way through the Curtain of Silk, we'll be thrust into a dusty old hallway laden with webs and washed with thick waves and clouds of grave dust. At the end of the hallway, there is a chest, but nothing of extraordinary interest. There was another door, however, a barred door. A barred door behind a shield of webs, behind a locked cage door, behind a barred door, behind a wall of webs, behind a barred door. Hmm, something tells me we aren't going to find flowers and rainbows in here. By the gods, an arachnophobe's nightmare. What is this? What have they been doing in here? Oh god, a pit of arachnids in a city of webs with bones and eggs strewn across the place with several bandits under the influence of their new masters, the spiders, servants to the fanged slave drivers. Their skin flushed yellow in veined patterns as the corruption of the spiders pulses through their blood, unable to resist, unable to run, unable to do anything but the spiders will. What kind of sick and twisted room is this? It was barred from the outside, so were these bandits locked in here, forced? to be harvested as meat vehicles, peons to the yellow and grey harvestmen. This is sick. Let's get out of here and see if we can get some closure on this hecatomb of cobweb clutched men. The cage. What's inside the cage? First off, there's a dead guy in here. Always a good sign. On the table, we can find various ingredients, salt, bone mold, gems, albino spider pods, and this creation of Frankenstein looking thing. We should search the dead guy for sure. This is the, too weird to explain. So this man is Servos Rendas. He has the same last name as Merila Rendas, the crazy spider lady we met earlier. They're probably siblings given they have the same last name. Now on his corpse, we can find his journal. 
She's finally done it. I knew she'd eventually crack. I probably should have left when I had the chance. The untapped power within these spiders has finally gone to Merilar's head. Who would have thought that these tiny albino creatures had the ability to harness such magic? Being locked in this cage is frustrating, of course, but it is keeping me even more focused on my work. What did she think I was going to do anyway? As my sister, she must have known how devoted I am to this. Although, I can't fault her for her actions right now. Who knows what kind of fumes these experiments have been giving off, or what effect they have on the brain. At least I'm alright. Or maybe I'm not, but I think I am. Uh, could these experiments be having the same effect on me that they have on her? <laughs> Magnificent! It seems as though you can combine any one of the base spiders with a modifier to tweak its behavior. For instance, just imbuing an albino spider pod with a ruby seems to create a spider that jumps at its victims and proceeds to explode. But by simply adding a salt pile to the mix, it creates the same manner of spider, but instead of jumping and exploding, it emits flames from its body. I'd experiment with more of these behaviors, but it seems the bandits we tested the mind to control spiders on are all still locked away. Merila doesn't want me to let them out. Maybe there are too many in there for her to handle. Ah, uh, I heard her muttering to herself earlier today. She was saying things like, <laughs> The spiders are mine, and they'll listen to me. <laughs> what exactly is she planning? I hope she's not attempting to enter the blocked off room in the main chamber. She knows we specifically sealed it after hearing odd chanting coming from that direction. Then again, what she used to know may not matter right now, considering the state that she's been in. I hope she'll be alright. And before we deconstruct that, on the table there is another book, The Spider Experiments. I've only tried a few combinations, but things look promising. Here's what I've discovered so far. Ruby plus albino pod equals jumping flame spider. Ruby plus damage pod equals exploding flame spider. Ruby plus salt pile plus damage pod equals nothing. Ruby plus salt pile plus albino pod equals flame cloaked spider. Hmm, looking at these results, it seems as though the purity of the gem could enhance the imbuing process in some unforeseen way. Perhaps I could get my hands on a flawless ruby. I have also theorized that if one were to mix most any of the ingredients in the previous experiments, a new discovery is likely to be made. Upon further inspection of both a diamond and a garnet, it seems they don't contain the necessary power required. I know for a fact that a ruby works, as seen in my previous experiments. Next, I'll see how the reaction works with an amethyst, emerald, or even a sapphire. There must be other types of spiders out there. Who knows what other kinds of imbuing processes have taken place. We'd best keep our eyes open. The source of the interaction will most likely be nearby. Whatever new species we find. Wow, okay, that is a lot to take in there. So Servos and Merilar were brother and sister experimenting on these albino spiders. Merilar went insane and locked her brother away in the cage and it seemed that he did most of the actual work. And apparently, she never let him out of the cage and he died, probably of starvation. Before both of them died though, they discovered that albino spiders could harness different types of energies and magics. As Servos notes, imbuing a spider pod with a ruby resulted in a flame spider. That would explain why we find flame spiders next to the fiery fragments of Red Mountain, and yet still find flame spiders in this tomb because of all of the ruby deposits. As he also notes, the source of the interactions will always be nearby. Red Mountain's fragments, flame spiders, ruby deposits, flame spiders. He also notes that they created mind-controlled spiders, which we have met many times, a sick creation. Luckily, they don't occur naturally. Wouldn't want a nest of those knocking around, they could take over Tamriel. So, how many types of spiders are there? 
Well, you can actually use the imbuing chamber to create a total of 16 different types of spiders that you can actually use. Now I have done a full guide on all 16 spiders that I highly recommend you check out as we run through in depth how each of the spiders works and how you can utilize them. And some of them are actually extremely overpowered. But for now, for this investigation, let's get out of this tomb, please. As we exit from the ladder we ran into earlier, we'll come out inside a small wooden shed surrounded by albino spiders and frost spiders. Now this is interesting because there is a sapphire deposit right here next to the shed, right next to where they're breeding. So these albino spiders and their variations do appear to occur naturally. Albino spiders breed and nest near a specific type of gem deposit, i.e. ruby, sapphire, emerald or amethyst, and they will become infused with their energies or magics, creating new subspecies of spiders, notably flame, frost, poison and shock. In Dwemer Ruins, there are also a very rare oil spider, who if you watch my guide for them, you'll know are probably the most OP thing in the game. Now, while these spiders do occur naturally and absorb powers, energies and magics from specific gems found within their natural surroundings, as service renders discovered, when the right equipment and ingredients are used, their mutations can be forced and one can arm themselves with an armory of weaponized spiders, just as Merila did when we ran into her. And despite all the different types of spiders, I think we can all agree that the mind control spiders are the creepiest. And while albino spiders are unique to Solstheim, this got me thinking. Down in the ancient Dwemer city of Blackreach, or Fal Zadam Din as it is known in Dwemeris, there are a huge infestation of spiders. Luckily, thank the nine divines, these are normal spiders and not albino spiders. Now the reason that that's really really good is because down here in Blackreach, we don't find ruby or sapphire or emerald or amethyst deposits, we find another type of deposit, geode veins. When mined, they yield Soul gems. Soul gems, the key ingredient required to create mind control spiders. So, imagine if someone brought albino spiders down here to breed. Instead of harnessing the power of rubies or emeralds, they'd harness the power and magic energy of the geode veins, soul gems, and they would breed naturally into mind control spiders. If left long enough, Blackreach would become a super nest of spiders that can latch onto people and take control of them. Imagine if they broke the surface, it would literally be the zombie apocalypse of the Elder Scrolls. Well, a variation of because actual zombie apocalypses have taken some form in the Elder Scrolls before. But regardless of specifics, how scary is that? And the fact that it could happen, the only thing that needs to be done is for some albino spiders to be brought down into Blackreach, left to breed naturally, neck minute there is a naturally formed army of mind control spiders ready to take over the population of Tamriel. Everyone's going to be walking around in full steel plate armor. Luckily, I don't think anyone's going to do that. But again, this got me thinking, what if one of the bandits being mind controlled in White Ridge Barrow knows of Blackreach and the spider controlling him forces him to carry a bunch of albino spider eggs down into Blackreach. Look, it's a lot of conjecture here, but nothing outside the bounds of possibility. It's scary, scary stuff. So I do hope that you've enjoyed the journey, the discovery and the unsettling conclusion that these spiders do occur naturally and can also be made unnaturally. Equally so, I do hope you learnt something new about the beautifully mad universe that these wonderful games take place in, The Elder Scrolls. But most importantly of all, what do you think about these spiders? Are they simple bugs to be squashed when need be? Or do they have the potential to cause biblical havoc? 
harmless little spiders or powerhouses waiting for the right magic to harness. If you have any information, facts, evidence, speculation, theories, or anything to do with the albino spiders of Solstheim and their variations, be sure to leave a comment down below, I'd love to hear what you have to say. If you have any ideas for something that should be covered in the Elder Scrolls Detective series, be sure to let me know, I'll look into whatever strange and wonderful topic you present. If you enjoyed this video, please do me a kindness and leave a like. And of course, if you did enjoy this video and want to see more videos similar to this one, please subscribe. It helps me know that people enjoy these kind of videos and will result in more of them in the long run. So be sure to click subscribe and that little bell icon next to the subscribe button right here on YouTube so that you are notified when new Elder Scrolls Detective videos are uploaded. Now my other Elder Scrolls Detective video links can be found down in the description and down there are also links to my social media. Media. If you would like to support the channel in a more personal way, you can become a patron on Patreon. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy, so your support is most appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. Feel free to check out the playlist on screen, thank you for watching, thank you for supporting the channel, and I'll see you very shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.